morning. Good morning. It is good to be with all of you worshiping in the house of the Lord this morning. Our call to worship is a responsive reading from Psalm 119. The words will be on the screen. So please join me in proclaiming God's word. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless. Who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. All my ways are steadfast and obey in your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider your commands. According to your word, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we do seek you with all of our hearts this morning. We ask that you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to your presence in this place. May your decrees and your will be revealed to us as we worship you. God, you are the God who goes before. So we thank you in advance for your presence in this place. Amen. And because we believe that God's presence goes before us, as always, we light the Christ candle as a constant tangible reminder of God's glory in this place. We light the Christ candle to remember that God is here, that God goes before us and prepares the way for us. And so I invite you to stand and to receive this blessing. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you to turn and pass the peace of Christ to one another.
Let us continue worshiping the Lord in song by singing Living Hope.
today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances. Then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not fear, nor are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to you, your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <coughs> We're going to prepare our hearts this morning by singing the song, Just As I Am. And Jesus' picture was up there. I have it as my face thing. 
and I'm so happy. We can testify, we can let others know about Jesus. We don't need to be quiet. They're quieting all of us. Out there in Colorado, there was a, um, a coach. He prays with his people. He's an NFL player from the past. And he prays with his, his team that he's working with and coaching with. And the atheist, whatever their letters are, came in and said, we do not want you doing that no more. You don't have the right to do that. You're a school. School is separated from church. And I'm thinking, praise God, the two athletes this week are awesome Christian young men who stand up and say, for the Lord, they're going to win. And I am so happy. We are all going to win for Christ. We are thankful for the ways that God has been at work in your life over these last couple of weeks, Sharon. We thank you for your testifying to that. And we are thankful that God invites us into this space of prayer just as we are, bringing whatever burdens or sorrows or worries of the world and laying them at the feet of Jesus. I invite you now to take a posture of prayer. As always, the altar to my right, your left, is open if you want to come and to kneel at the feet of Jesus. And the altar to my left, your right, is open if you want to come and to be anointed by Pastor Levi for a special touch of God. Let us pray. Just as we are, Lord, we come. We come before you not because we have somehow earned the right to approach you or have somehow made ourselves worthy to be in your presence, but because of you, because of your great love and mercy that led you all the way to the cross, we come before you now because you have welcomed us with open arms. Lord, we come before you as a people with sorrows and joys, with pains and triumphs. We come before you, Lord, seeking you, seeking to be yours alone, seeking to be your people, called by your name, set apart for your purposes. And Lord, we come burdened by many things. We come burdened for those who are recovering from injuries and illnesses, we come seeking healing and speedy recoveries for those who need a touch from you. We think of Emily and of Sharon and ask, Lord, that you would be especially near to them and bring them healing. We pray also for Carol Hoagland and her family as she is undergoing testing. We ask, Lord, that you would give her a special touch that you would give them grace and mercy and wisdom, that you would be with the doctors and guide them, and that, Lord, your healing hand would be upon her in the midst of this. But, Lord, we have burdened not just for ourselves and for our loved ones and our families, but, Lord, we are burdened for our neighborhood and our community, and ask, Lord, that you would be with it that you would bring healing to and justice and peace. Lord, we think also of those in the wider world. We think of Ukraine and the ongoing crisis there. We ask, Lord, that you would bring peace, that you would bring restoration 
and justice, that your will would be done. Lord, bring healing, we pray. Lord, we think also of the earthquakes that have devastated Turkey and Syria over the last week. Lord, the dead and the grieving, so many. Lord, we ask that you would be near to the brokenhearted, that you would bring healing and recovery to those who have been injured, that you would comfort those who mourn, and Lord, that you would be with the people who, as they struggle to rebuild following this devastation. Lord, you are a great and loving God, a God who cares about us, about our community, about the world at large. And so we come to you with these moments. Hear our prayer, Lord, and have mercy. Lord, we come to you for your pardoning, for your cleansing. We come to you to be yours alone. Lord, bring healing, we pray. Make us holy thine. Lord, we ask that you would be with Pastor Brecca as she proclaims your word this morning. We ask that you would that your, her words would not just be hers, but yours. And that you would give us all ears to hear and hearts to receive what you are saying through her this morning. Lord, we pray all this with your son's prayer in mind. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Amen. And I'm even gladder that God is in his house this morning. Amen. And I've been thinking a lot this past week about the feeding of the 5,000 and how that happened with just a small boy's offering. We all have something to give, and the question is, will we give it? I thought about that small offering, and I thought about a Sunday evening almost 40 years ago. Gigi and I were leaving church here, and we 
were attending another church, and I didn't want to leave that church. But anyway, um, we got a knock on our car window, and there was Pastor or, um, Paul Batman. And he said, would you like to come over to our house for a dish of jello and a glass of Kool-Aid? And we, we went, and he and, and Vivian were so gracious and loving to us that night. But all it took was a dish of jello and a, a glass of Kool-Aid. What you have in God's hands is multiplied over and over again. That was 40 years ago, and I know you're glad Gigi's still here. So. <laughs> yes. Ushers, if you'll come. Dear Heavenly Father, little is much if God is in it. Amen. We know today that you are a God who blesses the gift and the giver. And we are so thankful that St. Paul's has a wonderful reputation and even more than reputation, a witness of being a giving church, being a loving church, being a church that goes beyond itself to care for the people around it. We thank you for this offering today. We know that you're going to take it and bless it and, and use it not only here but around the world. Amen.
recommitting yourself to your baptism, reaffirming your baptism. We would love for you to be a part of that class. If you will let me know, I will get you signed up, and Pastor Levi will be leading that class throughout the weeks of Lent. It is always so good to be gathered together as the people of God in the house of the Lord. I'm so glad that each of you are here this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles if you have them this morning. We're going to continue in Matthew chapter 5. We are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most infamous sermon. And we're, of course, reading it from the perspective of the Gospel of Matthew. If you'll remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Levi started us off with preaching on the Beatitudes. And we heard Jesus proclaim this blessing over the most surprising people. Jesus said things like, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Even blessed are those who are persecuted. These types of people facing situations that our world would often not call blessed. And yet Jesus proclaimed this blessing over them. And then last week, we learned that this blessing of God that comes upon our lives carries with it a responsibility, a holy calling to be God's people in the world. And Jesus described this by saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You have been blessed to be a blessing. And this week, we are going to pick up, and it's just as lighthearted as the weeks before. It's, it's really not. <laughs> we are turning to Jesus' teaching on the law, and we're going to be talking about the topics of murder, adultery, divorce, and making oaths. Aren't you all glad you're here this morning? <laughs> I am glad you're here, and I think Jesus has an important word for us in the midst of this. I think it's an applicable word to where we find ourselves today, and so we are excited to hear from him this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're actually going to go back just a little bit to chapter 17 to make sure we get Jesus' beginning of talking about the law. So 17, and we are going to go through verse 37. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 37. And the word of the Lord reads, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, unless until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply, Yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Let us pray. <laughs> Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Children have a unique way of skirting the rules, of finding creative loopholes. I know this from my own personal experience as once being a child. I knew all of the shortcuts. But I have also relearned this most recently through the eyes of my children. You see, saying things like, your plate needs to be completely clean before you can have any dessert, leaves you open to loopholes, I've learned. For how they get that plate clean is open to interpretation. If you have a dog, the dog may eat it. I've caught Caleb more than once, shoveling it into the trash and bringing me a clean plate. It's open to interpretation. Or saying things like, the next time I come into this room, it better look very different. I don't want to see one single toy out on the floor. Any parents ever said something similar to that? Well, I have learned that this command, too, can be open to interpretation. I remember one particular time several years ago when Hannah and Caleb were still sharing a room, and I gave them a very similar command to this. Their toys were everywhere, and I just wanted it cleaned up. So I told them to clean their room, and I came back an appropriate amount of time later, fully expecting to have to repeat my command. But as I opened the door, I was very surprised and quite proud to see that their room, by all appearances, looked clean. It looked different, just like I had asked. There were no toys out on the floor, just like I had asked. So I was very surprised and proud until a few minutes later, I went into their room to put up laundry and I opened up that closet door. I'm sure you can guess what happened. Everything just comes piling out. Technically, they had followed my command. The room did look different. There were no toys laying out on the ground. And yet, though they had given the appearance of having done what I had asked, though they had technically jumped through all the right hoops, they were really missing out on the spirit of the command. They really missed out on what I was hoping to see from them. The room looked great on the outside, but the inside told a much different story. Before they get in too much trouble, my spot was under my bed. When it comes to following rules, to <laughs> obeying commands, we as humans get pretty good at hoop jumping, at loophole finding, at putting in the minimum amount of effort to check the right box and call it good. We technically do what we are asked, but we find creative ways of getting here. We are adept at making the outside look really good while praying that no one looks behind that closet door. It was not so different in Jesus' day either. Humans then too were pretty creative at finding just the right loopholes, at jumping through the right hoops, all while putting in minimum effort. They 
They were good at doing technically what they were asked to, and yet finding creative ways to get there. They checked all the right boxes, but they missed the purpose behind it. Jesus today in our text, in expounding upon the teaching of the law, knows that this creative process of rule keeping often applied to how the people followed the law of God as well. Even the commands of God were not off-limit from this creative, loophole-finding, hoop-jumping, box-checking way of getting things done. And here in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes this opportunity to teach with authority on the law. Not to critique the law, not to undermine the law, but to remind the people that were gathered there on the hillside of the reason that God had given the law to them in the first place. And to understand this, we have to go backwards for just a moment. If you remember, the first time we really begin to hear about the law is in the book of Exodus. God has just miraculously delivered this group of slaves out of slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness. And once they are there on the freedom side of the Red Sea, God gathers them together and begins to shape and form them into a particular kind of people. A people who no longer reflect the ways of Egypt, but who instead will be a people set apart for God's holy purposes in the world. A people who are called to reflect God's very character and nature on earth. And the way that God begins to organize their lives together is through the giving of what we know as the law. Commands from God that are intended to help the people live in right relationship with God and right relationship with one another. You see, it is God's desire as God brings the people out of Egypt that they might be a people so filled with the holy love of God that this love of God might begin to spill over into the lives of those around them. This is the purpose of the law, that they might be a people whose lives bear the fruit of of love. Jesus, after all, sums up the law in this way when he's later asked in Matthew's gospel, teacher, what is the greatest of the commands? And Jesus says, the first one is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. This is the greatest of all the commands. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets are summed up in these two commands. The purpose of the law is that God's people might be a people who, whose lives bear the fruit of love in the world. But as we come back to Matthew's gospel, and as Jesus looks around at the religious landscape of his day, as he looks at the way that God's commands and laws are being observed and followed, he begins to see that many people have missed the point. This law that was intended to lead the people into the way of life and blessing, as we read in our scripture reading this morning, too often had become legalistic in practice. Rather than seeing the law as a guide to help them live in right relationship with God and one another, these commands instead had too often become reduced down to checking the right religious boxes. Do this. Check. Don't do this. Check. The religious leaders, including the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, had become experts at demanding a rigid keeping of the law from others, but conveniently find loopholes for themselves that allowed them to check all the right religious boxes with minimal effort. And as a result, we see a good group of people who check all the right boxes. And though their lives appear holy and pristine and righteous from the outside, but we begin to realize that like my children's bedroom, once you start searching underneath the bed and in the drawers and opening the closet door, you begin to see that the outside does not match the inside. Their inward hearts did not match their outward appearances. All of their rule-keeping, all of their religious box-checking, all of their knowledge of the law was not leading them into deeper love for God and for those around them. And the proof of this is quite simple. Their lives did not bear the fruit 
of love. And Jesus makes it very clear to the crowd gathered there on that hillside that this way of law keeping exemplified in the Pharisees and the teachers of the law is not sufficient. It's not enough to check all the right boxes. It's not enough to go through the motions of worship. It's not enough to just appear holy from the outside. Instead, God cares about what is in the heart. Jesus says in verse 20, Truly I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will surely not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes it clear here. God not only looks what is on the outside, but God looks at what is inside. God desires not just for a transformation of behavior, but a transformation of the heart. Amen. And so Jesus here in our text demonstrates this by expounding upon common parts of the law. Parts of the law that everyone gathered there would have been familiar with. The law on murder and adultery and divorce and making oaths. And these, of course, were parts of the law that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would have proudly checked the right boxes with minimal effort, but for whom Jesus sees a deeper meaning behind that he wants to expound upon. Jesus starts with the issue of murder, saying to the crowd gathered there on that hillside, You have heard it said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You see, according to Jesus, it is not enough to simply refrain from murder, but we are also required to treat one another with respect. Right. What good is it to refrain from murder only to lash out in anger? What good is it to refrain from murder but then to treat someone as less than human with our words? To then denigrate them behind their backs? To offer extravagant gifts at the altar but to remain at odds with a brother or sister? Well, we begin to see in Jesus' teaching that this spirit of love that is the law is so deeply important to God that we cannot possibly hope to live in right relationship with God if we're not also living in right relationship with one another. It's one thing to check the right box. Do not murder. Check. That is what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and so many other good religious folk would have done with pride. But it is another entirely to be so moved by the love of God that we respect and show honor and dignity to every single person as a person created in the image of God. It is one thing to keep the law. It is an entirely other thing to live according to the spirit of the law. Jesus continues on. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, so many others in the religious community would have held their heads up in pride because they had not committed adultery. They could again check this box. But Jesus says it's not enough to physically avoid committing adultery. Instead, he takes it a step further. Do not treat any person as an object of consumption, as a means to an end. What good is it to avoid adultery if you objectify your neighbor? What good is it to avoid adultery in public, but to lust in secret over the images of pornography? What good is it to avoid adultery, but then to promote a purity culture that creates an entire gender as less than human? as less than persons created in the image of God. You see, according to Jesus, it's one thing to keep the letter of the law. It's one thing to be able to check that holy box. It is an entirely other thing to live according to the spirit of the law. Yes. Next, Jesus says, it has been said, 
anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, the good religious folk would have held their head up pride at hearing this command. We have kept the law, they would have thought. We have not been divorced, and for those of them who had, we have made sure to always offer a certificate of divorce, just like the law tells us. And yet Jesus does not so easily let them off the hook. Knowing that in this culture, any reason, even that of burning the toast for breakfast, could be justified as reason enough to offer a certificate of divorce to a wife. Jesus does not accept this. What good is it to follow the letter of the law and yet feel justified in your treatment of women as disposable? What good of it is it to avoid divorce, but then to treat your spouse with little respect? What good is it to go through the motions of providing a certificate of divorce while failing to provide systemic care for some of the most vulnerable persons in society? It's one thing to keep the letter of the law. It's one thing to check that holy box. It's an entirely other thing to live according to the spirit of the law. The last one for today. Jesus said again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord all the vows you have made. But I say to you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, for anything beyond that comes from the evil one. You see, there was a common loophole in the practice of making oaths in Jesus' day. People would avoid <coughs> making oaths in God's name, but would instead make oaths in the name of heaven or on Jerusalem, making people think that they were telling the truth, but then feeling free to manipulate and lie as they please. It was kind of like that common childhood tactic, maybe some of you did it, where you cross your fingers and you put them behind your back and then you feel free to say whatever you want. It was kind of like that, and yet as adults, these oaths often came with devastating consequences. What good is it to simply avoid making a false oath, but then to use our mouths to control and manipulate others to get our own way? What good is it to keep the letter of the law in our oaths and yet use those very oaths to make deals that take advantage of the poor and the foreigner? It's one thing to keep the letter of the law. It's an entirely other thing, according to Jesus, to keep the spirit of the law. Amen. Truly, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will surely not enter the kingdom of Church, it is so easy for the holy life to become legalistic, for holiness to become reduced down to a set of rules that we follow. Do this. Don't do this. And as long as we have all the right checked boxes in place, we, like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, can feel good about ourselves. We appear righteous to anyone who might be asked. We are good to go. Our one-way passport to heaven has been stamped. But in reality, as Jesus makes clear here, the life of holiness is not just about checking boxes. Keeping the law is not just about right behavior or stamping a 
relationship with your neighbor? What good are your songs of praise if that same mouth later denigrates a brother or sister in anger? What good are your extravagant gifts laid on the altar if you do not take up the cause of the least of these? What good is your fasting and prayer if it does not lead you outside of your comfort zone to a world in need? You see, Jesus is not just concerned about what can be seen on the outside. But Jesus is one who goes into the rooms of our house and begins to clean house. He begins to look under the bed and in the drawers and behind that dreaded closet door to see if our outward dis appearance matches our inward disposition. Does what we show to others on the outside match what's actually going on on the inside? Are we just checking religious boxes or have our hearts truly been transformed by the love of God? Are we just going through the motions or are our lives bearing the fruit of love? For I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Church, if we want to know what a holy life is to look like, we need to look no further than Jesus. Jesus comes as the fulfillment of the law because in Jesus we see a life fully transformed by love. For Jesus, the holy life is not just about checking all the right boxes, but about his willingness to humble himself in love for God and for others. By his care for the least of these, through his feeding of the hungry and healing the sick and touching the unclean, through his forgiveness of sins and welcoming in the stranger, by his willingness to give of himself for his neighbor, by his willingness to lay down his very life for a world in need. If we want to know what a holy life truly looks like, it looks like a life fully surrendered to this way of love. The church, the good news is that this is not a work that we have to do for ourselves. Making ourselves holy is not something we have to do in our own power and strength. It's not about just checking enough boxes. It's not about just doing the amount, this amount of right things or not doing this amount of right things. Instead, the only way we can be filled with the very holiness of God is to be filled with the love of God in such a way that it begins to overspill of our lives to a world in need. Amen. This life of holiness is a work of God and God alone. Amen. I'm sure many of you might have heard about the revival that has broken out at Asbury University this week. If you haven't heard about it, there was a regularly scheduled chapel service on Wednesday that never stopped. <laughs> it just continued on and spilled over into days of worship. And if I understand correctly, it's still continuing this morning as we speak. People have traveled from all over to go and to be a part of what is happening there, to see for themselves in hopes that the Spirit would fill them and revive them as well. Revival, particularly in our holiness tradition, is something that we talk about a lot. It's something we pray for often. And I think Jesus reminds us today through this word that revival begins with a work of the heart. Amen. With a genuine spirit of repentance. With allowing the spirit to come in and do some house cleaning. Not only looking at what we proudly present to others, but also taking a look under the bed inside the drawers, behind the closet door, and revealing to us anything that is not oriented toward love for God or love for neighbor. Revival begins in the heart. It begins as God's love fills and transforms us. But church, true revival never stops there. Amen. The fruit of a holy life is love. Love for God and love for neighbor. This spirit of repentance, this infilling of God's love will always lead us out to a world in need. That we might be a people set apart for God's holy purposes in the world. Church, this holy life is not something that we can manufacture. It's not something that we 
can achieve on our own. It doesn't come through checking enough religious boxes or attending enough worship services or laying enough extravagant gifts at the altar. It comes only through an encounter with the living God that so changes and transforms us and fills us with God's love that we are then sent out in the power of the Spirit to the world around us. My prayer is that this is the fruit that we will see in the coming days from this revival at Asbury. That what began in a sanctuary behind closed doors would not stay there. But that instead, the power of the Spirit would blow people out to spill over the love of God to Amen. a world in need. Amen. And it is my prayer that this same fruit might be born through our lives today, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our community. In just a moment, we are going to come to receive the good gifts of God at the table. And as we do that, we are going to take just a moment to prepare our hearts. Because I want to make space for the Spirit to work. To make space for us to humble ourselves before the Lord with a spirit of repentance. To make space for the Spirit to search the rooms of our hearts, to look under the bed and behind the closet door. To make space for us to surrender to God anything that is not oriented by love for God and love for me. <coughs> My prayer today is that the love of God will so fill us that we cannot help but overflow in love for God and for neighbor this week. That what God does in this sanctuary, behind these closed doors, will not stay here. It will begin to overflow and spread out Amen. to our world. We're going to sing a song this morning. It might be a new one for some of us, but it's one that I've come to love, and I think it speaks of the heart that God asks us to have. The title is Not Yet I, But Through Christ in Me. I think it's a beautiful reminder that everything that we are, everything that we have, is not through pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps or checking the right religious boxes, but is a gift of grace alone. A gift of grace that is available to each and every one of us. God desires to fill us today. Let us prepare our hearts.
but you working in and through us. God, as we prepare to come and to receive these good gifts, as we prepare to come and say yes to you once again, we ask that we might be filled with your very spirit today. Fall on us anew. Fall on us afresh. Do something new in us today. God, we give you permission to clean house in our hearts. Show us those things within us that are not of you. Show us the ways that we've just been going through the motions, proudly checking the religious boxes, and yet not living in love for you and for our neighbor. Show us the ways that we've been overcome by anger, and yet proudly saying we've never murdered. Show us the ways that we've given into lust, and yet said we've never committed adultery. May the inside of our hearts be as pure and as pleasing to you as what we so proudly present to those around us. May we be a people whose inside and outside match. May we be a people who are so consumed by your holy love that everything that we do, that everything that we say is motivated and oriented by love for you and for those around us. And as we are filled by your spirit today, as we receive these good gifts at your table, we ask that we might be spent, sent out by the power of your spirit. We know that the work that you do in these times of worship cannot stop here. If it does, it is not true revival. If it does, it's not really you at work. It's an emotional experience. But God, if it is truly you at work filling us, then we will be a people who are sent out by the power of the Spirit in the world to be the hands and feet of Christ. To be love, not to judge the world, but to demonstrate the love that you have for it. Fill us and send us, we pray. For we know that this work is only done by your grace, by the gift that you offer. Empower us for this good work today and prepare us to come and receive these good gifts this morning at your table. And we will be careful to give you all praise and glory and honor this morning, not only for what you are doing in this moment, but for the ways that it will spill over into our families and our neighborhoods and our community in the days to come. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
Church, hear this good news for us this morning. While we were yet sinners, Christ has died for us, proving God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. At this table, we remember that on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had blessed it and given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving to be a holy and living sacrifice in union with these good gifts, Christ's sacrifice for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you would pour out your spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet together. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Church, as you are ready, I'm going to invite you to come and to receive these good gifts this morning. Come with open hands, symbolizing your need for what God only can provide. And as we receive, the appropriate response is to say, thanks be to God. We will then take the elements back to our seats and receive them together. Church, come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. you to pull back to the next layer to reveal the juice. Church, this is the blood of Christ, which has been shed for you. Drink in remembrance of his holy sacrifice. And 
together we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have freely given yourself to us. Grant that we may now go into the world in the strength and power of your spirit to give of ourselves for others in love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, I invite you to stand to receive this morning's benediction. May not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law be written on our hearts that we are sent out as a visible and tangible sign of God's love in the world. And that means loving our neighbor as well. So may we be blown out by the power of the Spirit to love our neighbors as we love God. Let us go singing God's praise together. Praise God from